Dr. Jason Saunders here, and today we're gonna to talk about the mechanisms of action of hyperbaric oxygen. We need to become masters of mechanisms of action because once upon a time, hyperbaric oxygen was only used for decompression sickness, for the bends. Any other use that was ever considered for hyperbaric, whether that's for wound care, which is now very traditional use of hyperbaric, or osteonecrosis, or osteomyelitis, or gangrene, these were all off-label conditions that eventually became on-label conditions based on clinical use and research and all the things required to get something to become you know, an on-label use of a device. It's the mechanisms of action that are ultimately what help to determine whether or not it's even appropriate to consider using hyperbaric for a particular condition or for a particular health goal. It doesn't have to be for sickness. As we well know, hyperbaric is used for wellness and performance and just overall health, anti-aging. Those are becoming more and more popular as, as uses of hyperbaric oxygen and for good reason. And once you understand the mechanisms and really, really uh, key into what those mechanisms are, if you can apply those mechanisms to what the health goals are or what the condition might be, then you could start to make practical use of hyperbaric oxygen for the people either in your life or the patients that you treat or for yourself. There are a multitude of benefits of hyperbaric, increased energy or ATP formation, a balancing of the reactive oxygen species inside your body, angiogenesis, which is the rebuilding of new blood vessels. It helps to reduce swelling. It increases perfusion. It decreases inflammation, increases mitochondria, and the number of mitochondria that your body has or your cells have, increases superoxide dismutase, which is a way that your body handles free radicals, helps balance epigenetic expression, helps to balance and regulate your immune system. It does all of these things inside of our body through a varied type of hyperoxia, hypoxia exposure. In other words, going into the chamber gives you all this extra oxygen. While you have that extra oxygen, your mitochondria can start to use that extra oxygen for all of its normal functions and to start upregulating the healing process. But the long-term effects of hyperbaric happen because of repeated hyperoxia and back to normal oxia. When you go in the chamber, you get all this extra oxygen. When you leave, it starts to leave your body. When you go back in the chamber, you get this extra oxygen. And when you leave the chamber, it starts to leave your body. And that creates a cascade of cell signaling that seems to also uh, generate a much higher amount of all of this growth factor, these stem cells, and ultimately the, the cell signaling required for repair of your, your cell membranes, repair of your DNA, uh, repair of your epigenome, the rebuilding of new capillary beds, the stem cell release. All of these seem to be much more uh, as a result of the cell signaling cascade from the repetitive hyperbaric exposures over the course of weeks and months. And so there's a handful of mechanisms of action that have been pretty well documented throughout researching hyperbaric oxygen, even through all the 14, you know, traditional uses of hyperbaric. It's the same mechanisms that show up over and over again. And I'm going to read through those just to give you what they are and explain what they mean. Those are the mechanisms that we then need to use to say, is it appropriate for these other conditions, these off-label or ultimately over a hundred internationally recognized indications for hyperbaric, would it be appropriate that these mechanisms would help these conditions and or these mechanisms help, you know, performance or recovery, you know, even with, uh, with healthy people. The first one is decreasing bubble size. And really that's the main indication that relates back to decompression sickness and the bends. For the majority of the cases that we're going to talk about, decrease in bubble size is really not that critical, but that is the initial mechanisms of action. And that was the first reason that we were able to use hyperbaric oxygen for decompression sickness. The next one is hyperoxygenation. What does that mean? It means you're getting more oxygen when you go inside that chamber. That happens every single time you go into the chamber. Reduced lipid peroxidation. So that's basically lipids are fats and peroxidation is being oxidized. And when fats get oxidized, they become inflamed and they start breaking down and don't function well. Your cell membranes are lipids. The myelin around nerves is lipids. The membranes around your mitochondria or the membranes around your nucleus that holds your DNA, those are all lipids. And so controlling and reducing lipid peroxidation inside of our body is critical to having normal, healthy cell function. Vasoconstriction. It sounds counterintuitive. That means, you know, blood vessels are going to shrink. And when you're thinking, well, we want more oxygen. Why would we want vasoconstriction? Well, at certain pressures, the vasoconstriction is much higher than at lower pressures, but that vasoconstriction could also do a lot of uh, wonders for somebody with different types of edema or swelling 
especially in an acute injury. And so that vasoconstriction could be really important. You're still going to deliver a high level of oxygen, whether there's vasoconstriction or not. But the vasoconstriction can help really minimize swelling or inflammation in an area. Reduced cytokine response. What does that mean? That means literally reducing inflammation. So through hyperbaric oxygen, it not only reduces the inflammatory uh, interleukins and TNF alpha, but it also helps to stimulate our own body's anti-inflammatory cytokines. And so we get a real balancing of reduction of inflammation from hyperbaric, but also reduction of inflammation because our own natural anti-inflammatories start to become upregulated. Toxin inhibition. So at certain pressures of oxygen, we can suppress toxin expression from certain microbes like gangrene, but also other infections like mold or H. pylori or C. diff. As you put pressure on those microbes through pressurized oxygen and you can decrease the, um, the toxin release from those microbes, you can really help reduce the symptoms associated with the toxin expression. Leukocyte oxidative killing. And so part of our white blood cells ability to fight infection has to do with our white blood cells using reactive oxygen species, ROS, and literally spilling those contents, the reactive oxygen species on viruses or bacteria. And that helps to kill the infection. Part of the benefit of hyperbaric or one of the mechanisms is that hyperbaric does increase your reactive oxygen species in your body. There's positives and negatives to that, which we will cover in a different video. But part of the benefits of that is that as you're increasing your reactive oxygen species, you're loading your white blood cells with the ammunition they need to actually help fight infection better. Antibiotic synergy. So we know that there are certain bacteria that are very resistant to traditional antibacterial treatments. And more so, there are certain bacteria that actually lay these biofilms that become protective layers to shield them from things like antibiotics. So hyperbaric does two things. One, hyperbaric helps to break down those biofilms, but hyperbaric also helps to make the bacteria more sensitive to the antibiotic. So in cases where a patient needs the antibiotic and they're just not working properly, as a result of the hyperbaric exposures, and the, and the excess oxygen, especially because most pathogens in bacteria are anaerobic. In other words, they live in very low or no oxygen environments. As we expose them to these really high oxygen environments, we're able to weaken the bacteria, making them more susceptible to the antibiotic. And again, breaking down those biofilms, also making the bacteria more susceptible to your own immune system and to the antibiotics if, if they're being needed. Angiogenesis, so that's literally the rebuilding of the microcirculation. So in many times with toxin exposures or chronic inflammation, or certainly with trauma, we get a breakdown of the microcirculation in around certain areas. It's in the microcirculation that all the gas exchange occurs. So in order for your body to feed your cells oxygen and or for your body to pull carbon dioxide and other waste products out of the cell, we need to have an intact capillary network around all the different cell types and tissue types inside of our body. And when those capillaries are broken or if they have inflammation and the red blood cells aren't able to go through or, or the general circulation is, is subpar, the two consequences of that are is one, we're not getting the oxygen into the cell for the function. And number two is we're not able to get rid of the waste products. And now in and around that cell type and tissue type, the inflammation continues to build and build. As a result of hyperbaric and helping to either heal the existing microcirculation or stimulate the regrowth of new vasculature, the angiogenesis, we can literally recreate new highways of plasma and red blood cells in order to deliver oxygen and remove those waste products. That's one of the most well-studied benefits or mechanisms of action of hyperbaric. Neurogenesis, I mean, that's literally regrowing nerve tissue. Nerves have a very, very uh, high requirement for oxygen. It's one of the most metabolically active cell types that we have inside of our body. Our brain only makes up about 2% of our body mass, but it uses somewhere between 20 to 25% of all the oxygen in our body. So as cells get, or nerve cells specifically, either have damaged capillaries and they're not getting the oxygen that they need, or they're exposed to some sort of toxin or damage, they downregulate their activity very quickly. And hyperbaric oxygen is one of those things, as you deliver these high levels of oxygen, you can start to repair, wake up and regenerate nerve tissue to again, function better. Mitogenesis is regrowing of new mitochondria. So as your body's exposed to hyperbaric oxygen over a period of time, the body wants to use that oxygen as efficiently as it can. And so if there's more oxygen available than the mitochondria can uh, metabolize, what your body will do is the mitochondria will grow in size 
and then they'll start duplicating. You'll have increased mitochondrial density as a result of these repetitive hyperbaric exposures so that your body could utilize as much of this oxygen as possible, make as much cellular energy as it can to, to create an improved performance or improved healing response, depending on whatever the body's needing in that cell type or that tissue type. Fibroblast proliferation and collagen synthesis. So again, especially as a result of either years and years of use and abuse to our bodies or a very specific trauma that breaks down the soft tissues, the muscle, the tendon, the ligament, the cartilage, all these tissues that are basic precursors from fibroblasts and, and uh, collagen synthesis. The repetitive use of hyperbaric stimulates growth factors to go in and regrow and heal the, the fibroblast related tissues, the collagen related tissues. And so this is a huge part of that regenerative process uh, of hyperbaric oxygen. Next is it helps to boost your stem cells. There've been multiple studies on this looking at both mesenchymal stem cells. So stem cells that'll become different parts of your musculoskeletal system, but also central nervous system stem cells, stem cells that are gonna become part of your brain and spinal cord. And there's up to an eight times increase in stem cell production as a result of hyperbaric oxygen. And then one of the newer ones, which came out from a paper uh, about two years ago at this point, 2019, increased telomere length. And so what we know about telomeres is that, you know, they're protective caps on the ends of your DNA. And we understand that cells that are uh, aging faster or exposed to more oxidation or breaking down at a faster rate tend to have shorter telomeres. And so the assumption is that uh, as cells break down and age, and especially age faster, those telomeres keep breaking down faster and faster. In many ways, we're looking at through nutrition or exercise or other modalities, can we slow the process of telomere degradation? This paper that came out a couple of years ago actually showed the beginning of what should be considered literal regrowing of telomeres. And so this is one of the first times that a modality has been shown not only to slow the degradation process, but actually to regrow. And this paper showed a 20% increase in telomere length after about two months worth of treatment. And specifically, that's through an enzyme called reverse transcriptase. And so if we can stimulate those enzymes to regrow more telomeres, what we're doing is we're, we're adding to the protective caps of our DNA. From an aging standpoint, protecting our DNA from damage so that cells can continue to function properly and replicate normally so that new cells can keep regrowing and stem cells can keep filling in the gaps you know, from the old and the dying cells, that protection of our DNA is probably one of the most important things we can do from an aging standpoint. And again, this paper showed, you know, an amazing approach to helping protect the DNA from the typical damages of our life. So those are the main mechanisms of action related uh, to hyperbaric oxygen. And again, what's really important to say is all the indications that hyperbaric has been used forever were all off-label. So even though right now we have 14 on-label indications, those 14 on-label indications had to go through a process in order to become recognized as on-label. And that's often through a burden of proof and through clinical observations, which lead to research studies, which leads to consensus amongst the people making the decisions whether these conditions should be considered on-label or off-label. For many, many years, people have said, you know, hyperbaric for off-label conditions, there's no research in that. And while I'll say it's been limited for many, many years over the last eight to 10 years and really in the last four or five years, the amount of research available for hyperbaric for so many of the hundred other internationally recognized conditions has grown tremendously. Year after year, we're getting more and more papers showing that hyperbaric does help with so many different conditions, but it's not that they're curing the condition. Even when we talk about it from a non-label standpoint, it's not curing the condition. It's because of these mechanisms of action. And when these mechanisms of action are at work, cells start to heal, inflammation starts to reduce, stem cells are released, growth factors are released, and we start to see the effects on cell performance, on tissue type performance, on regenerative nature of hyperbaric, and ultimately on the chronic inflammation and or aging process. And, and there's so much evidence that's coming out now to prove it, and, and there's more in store over the next couple of years, I know, uh, that's going to continue to mount that that evidence to support hyperbaric oxygen for all these other cases. But again, whether they become on label or not is less important to me than can we can we understand the mechanisms of action and can we properly apply a therapy for a particular health goal, understanding those mechanisms and therefore applying the therapy properly. And that is the mechanisms of action of hyperbaric. 
and we can now utilize those to be more efficient and make sure that we're keeping patients safe and ultimately being very effective with the therapy that we're using. So thanks again, and I uh, will see you next time.